central to the development of modern flight, Wings Over the World. Then go into battle with Wings at War, next on Discovery Wings. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union introduces the MiG-29 Fulcrum to the West. It is an awesome machine, powerful, fast, and agile. Today, the MiG-29 remains among the top fighters in the world, but it belongs to the last generation of Soviet aircraft design. Artyom Mikoyan was the first head of the MiG Design Bureau, which was set up in the Soviet Union in December 1939. His second in command was Mikhail Gurievich. The name MiG comes from a combination of the initial letters of their two names. In World War II, they produced the MiG-1 and the MiG-3 piston engine fighters, but it wasn't until the post-war years when they began to develop jet aircraft, the MiG-9 and the MiG-15, that their design bureau began to become a legend. In the 1950s and 60s, their aircraft dominated the Soviet fighter inventory and caused Western defense authorities many sleepless nights. By 1969, Mikhail Gurievich had retired and ill health forced Artyom Mikoyan to leave his beloved bureau forever. His last project was the MiG-23, the workhorse Soviet fighter of the 70s. Rostislav Belyakov took over as head of the bureau, which was now renamed Mikoyan. Belyakov had been working with MiG since 1941. He was a graduate of the Moscow Aviation Institute. One of his first jobs with MiG was helping to modernize the armament system of the MiG-1 and MiG-3 fighters. After the war, he became manager in charge of developing the landing gear for the MiG jets. It could be a challenging job. The Soviet Air Force always placed great emphasis on the need for robust landing gear that could survive the most primitive airfields. In 1962, Belyakov became Artyom Mikoyan's deputy. He was also Mikoyan's personal choice as his successor. Belyakov became head of the design bureau after Artyom Mikoyan's death in 1970. By the mid-70s, a new generation of American fighters, strongly influenced by the revolutionary MiG fighters of the 60s, was causing concern in the Soviet Union. This new generation rejected the idea that a combination of beyond visual range radar and air-to-air -air missiles was the ultimate approach to fighter aircraft. There was a swing back to the classic fighter, a fast and highly maneuverable machine capable of dueling one-on-one -on -one with an equally agile opponent. The U.S. Navy's Grumman F-14 Tomcat was designed for fleet defense. It was by far the largest of the new fighters. Like the MiG-23, it had variable geometry wings to give it good high and low speed performance. It was not as light and maneuverable as the American fighters that would follow, but it was a step in what Soviet authorities saw to be a new direction. The McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle, on the other hand, was an incredibly flexible aircraft. It could fly at two and a half times the speed of sound, it was extremely maneuverable and could operate equally well as a classic air superiority dogfighter or as a straightforward ground attack aircraft. Some authorities consider it to be too versatile, a complex and expensive overreaction to the false notion that the Soviet MiG-25 was a dogfighter as well as an ultra-high-speed interceptor.
The General Dynamics F-16, though, was a pure dogfighter in the traditional sense. It was light, highly maneuverable, and much less complex and expensive than the F-15 to produce. It could also be adapted quite successfully for ground attack. It was in the price range of many Western countries, looking for a straightforward, effective fighter aircraft, and the Soviets knew it was likely to be manufactured in large numbers. The fourth of this group of new fighters was the McDonnell Douglas F.A. 18 Hornet. It started life as a competitor to the F-16 in the lightweight fighter competition, but went into service with the U.S. Navy as a multi-role fighter to replace both the F-4 Phantom and the A-7 Corsair attack aircraft. At the time, the workhorse fighter of the Soviet Union was the MiG-23, still a member of what was considered to be the third generation of jets. The new American fighters were a step beyond the performance of the MiG-23. They formed a fourth generation of fighter evolution. Soviet authorities watched their development closely, knowing that in some way they would have to make a move to counter the growing American superiority over the Soviet fighter force. The MiG-25, even though it was extremely fast and capable of excellent high-altitude performance, was not the answer. It was an all-out interceptor, and no amount of modification could transform it into a dogfighter. In the early 70s, work began in the Soviet Union on the development of a pair of aircraft to match the high and low end of the new American fighter generation. There was no shortage of information on the American project. A great deal could be found easily in specialist Western aviation magazines. Soviet intelligence made an all-out effort to acquire information on the latest development. The Mikoyan company's design team was originally headed by Alexander Chumashenko. Vano Mikoyan, Artyom's nephew, was deputy chief designer. The Mikoyan design team job was to develop a fighter to counter the F-16. At the same time, the Suhoi Bureau was working on a larger, more complex and more expensive aircraft in the style of the F-15. The Mikoyan Bureau's fighter would be called the MiG-29 and the Suhoi company's the Su-27. The MiG-29 was designed around a central fuel tank. The whole structure did not have a fuselage in the traditional sense. The central section was designed as a lifting surface generating 40% of the aircraft's total lift. Leading edge extensions were added to the wings for efficiency at the high angles of attack needed for combat aircraft. At first, the new aircraft was known as Object 9-12. In the course of its development, several alternative configurations were investigated, including one F-15 lookalike. But the layout originally chosen was found to be more aerodynamically efficient. Soviet design bureau were equipped with computer technology, but relied on it much less than their Western counterparts. There's a Russian term, nakalyanki, which means working with a piece of paper on your knee. It's an approach highly respected in Russia, challenging the designer's resourcefulness, often giving outstanding results, at a fraction of the cost of similar results in the West. On the other hand, in the 1970s and 80s, cost was not a real factor in the design of a new aircraft. Usually, Soviet designers were ordered to produce the best results possible, regardless of cost. In the Soviet Union, the defense industries in general, and the aircraft industry in particular, had great prestige. 
The design bureau attracted the brightest young graduates of universities and colleges. It was particularly prestigious to work at Mikoyan, but there were also material rewards. The salary was higher than average, and there were better housing opportunities. The Discovery Wings Channel is rolling out the red carpet. Get ready for Celebrity Wings. Join us for a who's who of high-flying headliners. Famous faces from all walks of life with a passion for flight. I just love the feeling of speed. Escape from the public eye and into the wild blue yonder. This fall, we're following the stars in the sky. Celebrity Wings. Mondays at 9.30, only on the Discovery Wings Channel. Construction work on the first prototype began in the mid-70s at the Mikoyan Bureau's prototype construction facility in North Moscow. It was built using conventional stressed skin aluminium construction. On the basis of experience gained in the construction of the MiG-23 and 25, automatic welding was widely used in the airframe structure. It made production much less labor intensive than riveting. Composite materials were used in the structure of the MiG-29 to save weight where possible. Comprehensive load tests were carried out to make sure that the aircraft could stand the great stresses of dogfighting. It was designed to withstand more than 12 Gs, 12 times the force of gravity. Development of the radar-based weapons control system continued as the prototype was built. It was to be controlled by a pulse Doppler radar with look-down, shoot-down capability. It was to have a conventional antenna. It was to have an infrared search and track system with a laser rangefinder. The pilot was to be equipped with a helmet-mounted sight. Four different Soviet aviation research institutes advised on aerodynamics, jet engines, construction materials, and weapons and electronics. Mikhail Waldenberg, who was to take over as chief designer of the MiG-29 in 1982, once said that there is no way for a pilot to break the airframe of the MiG-29. The pilot would break first. This is the first prototype of the MiG-29. It's now on permanent display at the Monino Air Force Museum near Moscow. The prototype's nose wheel was in front of the jet intakes. It had to be moved back on production models so that it wouldn't throw mud or dust from dirt runways directly into the engines. Unlike its direct competitor, the F-16, the MiG-29 has two engines. The Soviet Air Force insisted on two engines as a safety factor. 
because a number of single-engine aircraft had crashed in pilot training. The engines of the MiG-29s are not the traditional Tumanskis. They are Klimov RD-33 turbofans, which produce a combined total of about 35,000 pounds of thrust. This gives the 29 an extremely high thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.12, which means that after takeoff, it's capable of going straight up. The two engines are separated by a large air brake, and in the center of the air brake, there's a compartment that houses the drag chute, released on landing to slow the aircraft down. On October the 6th, 1977, Chief Test Pilot Alexander Fedotov took off in the MiG-29 prototype 901 for its first flight. This flight was uneventful, but later in the test program, crashes would seriously injure both Fedotov and another test pilot, Valery Menitsky. After the first flight, there was the traditional Russian ceremony in which the test pilot is thrown in the air. Saturday, Discovery Wings drops in for the Dayton Air Show as the hometown of the Wright Brothers celebrates 100 years of flight. Join people from all over the country and enjoy everything aviation. We give you a front row seat for mind-blowing stunts and an up-close glimpse at the historic planes at one of the biggest air shows in the world. Celebrate the centennial where it all began. The Dayton Air Show, Thunder in the Sky, Saturday at 8 on Discovery Wings. The Mikoyan Bureau chose not to install a fly-by-wire control system in the MiG-29. They considered that fly-by-wire technology, in which a computer interprets the pilot's control movements before passing them on electronically to the controls, was not yet mature enough in the Soviet Union. But the MiG-29's control system is not simply mechanical. It is intelligent to some extent, a step halfway between a traditional control system and fly-by-wire. Soviet pilots consider lack of fly-by-wire is not necessarily a disadvantage. They point to examples where pilots have been killed because the computer would not let the pilot pull high enough G-forces to get out of trouble. They say that fly-by-wire makes an average pilot better, but they say an excellent pilot will get more from an aircraft without fly-by-wire. The Klimov jet engines of the MiG-29 have high thrust and relatively low fuel consumption, but they are smokier than their Western counterparts. Western pilots say that smoke gives away an aircraft in visual combat at longer range, but the Soviet Air Force never seemed to be concerned about it. The MiG-29 test and evaluation program lasted five years. It wasn't until mid-1982 that initial production began at the huge Gaz-30 plant in Moscow, about three miles away from Mikoyan headquarters. Unlike Western aircraft manufacturers, Russian Design Bureau are just that. Apart from building prototypes, they are not a combined design and production facility. Under the system developed by the Soviets, there is the Ministry of Aircraft Industry, the Design Bureau, and separate production factories. Although Mikoyan has no production facility of its own, traditionally, manufacture of MiG aircraft has begun at Gaz-30. 30, 30,000 people work at this plant. 3,000 of them don't manufacture aircraft. They make refrigerators and household goods.
The first operational MiG-29s began to reach Soviet Air Force squadrons in August 1983. At that time, the flight test program was still going on. But initial problems of engine failure had been solved. Confidence in the aircraft was so high and the need for it so pressing that it was put into service before tests were complete. The first production aircraft was supplied to the Kubinka Air Regiment, located about 40 miles west of Moscow. For almost 50 years, NATO has assigned code names to new Soviet aircraft as they appear. Soviet aircraft manufacturers and the Soviet Air Force have followed them with interest. Some, like the Frogfoot tag assigned to the Su-25, they found offensive. But the MiG-29's designers accepted the NATO name Fulcrum with pleasure. Russians use it as the aircraft's standard nickname. A two-seater trainer version of the MiG-29, the MiG-29UB, was manufactured in the city of Gorky, 200 miles east of Moscow, where both the MiG-25 and 31 were produced. The Mikoyan Design Bureau won an important Soviet award for the MiG-29. Under the Soviet system of incentives for high-quality work, the government allocated money to build apartment houses for Mikoyan employees. About 200 families were given new apartments. In 1984, Mikoyan's chief test pilot, Alexander Fedotov, was killed when he was forced to eject at high altitude after his engine exploded. He was succeeded by Valery Minitsky, who had been his partner throughout the test program of the MiG-29. In 1988, a group of Mikoyan test pilots had an experience unique in Soviet aviation. They were given the job of taking these top-secret, deadly Soviet fighters to the West and showing them off to the rest of the world. MiG-29s had already been seen in the West once, but by a limited audience. Since 1974, there had been a traditional exchange visit of Soviet aircraft to Finland. In 1986, six MiG-29As visited a Finnish airbase and showed off their aerobatic capabilities to an audience of Western observers. The 1988 expedition was to a much larger forum, the Farnborough Air Show in England. Mikoyan pilots Anatoly Kvotchur, Roman Taskaev and Yuri Yermakov were chosen to fly a MiG-29A single-seater and a MiG-29UB trainer to England via Wittstock in East Germany. It was a major step for the Russians. They would, in effect, be competing against the top Western manufacturers of fighter aircraft. And the aircraft they were flying, though new to the West, were designed in the 1970s. Taskaev, Kvotchur, and Yermakov 
took off on the last leg of their trip to England and were escorted into British airspace by tornadoes of the Royal Air Force. For pilots from a country with a reputation for secrecy, the Russians impressed aviation journalists and the public with their openness and direct, friendly manner. The MiG-29 also impressed the Farnborough crowd and caused a great deal of comment and controversy among rival fighter manufacturers. There were claims and counterclaims about whose aircraft was superior, but there was no doubt that the Russian pilot stole the show with routines that demonstrated the extreme maneuverability of the MiG. Aviation experts and laymen made the most of the opportunity of seeing state-of-the-art Soviet aircraft at close quarters. Given the intensity of Soviet relationships with the West in the post-war years, it was extraordinary to see an American General Dynamics F-16 parked right next to its Soviet rival. Discovery Wings Channel. There are two aerobatic teams in the Soviet Air Force, both based at Kubinka, outside Moscow. These pilots are the Swifts. They fly MiG-29s. The other team is the Russian Knights. They fly Sukhoi-27. Swifts fly a mixture of single and two-seater MiGs, generally in a group of six, with a seventh aircraft flying solo. The Swifts were formed by volunteer operational pilots performing formation aerobatics in their spare time. Only relatively recently did they receive aircraft exclusively for aerobatic use, painted in their own color scheme. Kubinka has always been the Soviet headquarters for formation flying and aerobatics. It's also a showplace where foreign delegations have come in the past to see the best of Soviet aviation. These days, Kubinka holds regular air shows that are open to the public. The standard of flying the audience sees is very high indeed. Past Soviet aerobatic teams have used MiG-17s and MiG-21s. Pilots of the Swifts say that the MiG-29 is the best precise formation aerobatic aircraft they have flown. Western pilots who have flown the MiG-29 say it achieves much the same performance as Western fighters equipped with fly-by-wire control systems. 
They say the higher thrust to weight ratio of the MiG and some superior design points make that possible. The major difference between the MiG and fly-by-wire Western aircraft is that the MiG's controls take a lot more physical effort to move. This doesn't mean that you need great strength, but full-time attention has to be paid to factors that in Western aircraft would be looked after by the computer. Western pilots find the agility of the fulcrum amazing and say that its low speed performance is at least equal to any Western fighter. They find the claim of engines outstanding in power and response, giving the aircraft tremendous acceleration. In formations like this, the distance between aircraft can be as little as 10 to 15 feet. Since MiG-29s have been appearing at Western air shows, they've created great interest. Among their repertoire are two extremely impressive maneuvers, the tail slide, in which the aircraft goes straight up and then slides down backwards, and the Cobra, in which an aircraft flying straight and level suddenly flips its nose up past the vertical and brings it down again. The Russians perform these maneuvers very close to the ground. It's spectacular, but it can also be dangerous. In 1989, at the Paris Air Show, Anatoly Kvotchur's engine failed to respond, coming out of a low-level tail slide, and he was forced to eject. His MiG-29 crashed, and was destroyed, but in spite of the fact that he was so low that his parachute could not open fully, Vaucher was flying again in a few hours. Vaucher says that the sensation of ejection is very smooth. He should know. He was forced to eject once again, this time from a two-seater MiG. Again, he was at low altitude, and again he survived. In 1993, at an air show at Fairford in England, two MiG-29s had a mid-air collision during a display. Again, both pilots survived. Russian pilots have at times been criticized for flying these aircraft too close to the edge of the flight envelope. The Russians contend that the great thrust ratio of the MiGs compared with Western fighters make such flying acceptably safe. Sets another world comes to life at Discovery HD Theater. The new 24 hour high definition TV channel from Discovery will take you into the dark and show you things you've never seen before with a quality and detail you've never imagined. Wild nights, what you see will amaze you. After dark, it's a whole new planet. This summer on Discovery HD Theater, order Discovery HD Theater today. Call your local cable provider, Direct TV, or Dish Network. Here at the Discovery Wings Channel, we understand there's more to fly than just flying. Welcome to the Aviation Files, your in-depth look at the world of flight. We'll take you behind the scenes, inside the tower, and onto the assembly line floor. We'll show you breakthrough designs and put the state of the art to the test. 
Don't just take off. Go beyond the cockpit and open up the aviation files. Sundays at 7, only on the Discovery Wings channel. This is the MiG-29's big cousin, the Sukhoi Su-27. It's the top end of the Russian fighter inventory, designed in Soviet days as a counter to the mighty American F-15 Eagle. It's an aircraft of stunning power and performance. It's much bigger than the MiG-29 and weighs 70% more. This mechanic standing between the Su-27's twin vertical fins gives some idea of its massive scale. Apart from being roomier, the cockpit layout of the Su-27 is similar to the MiG-29's. It has the same ejection seat. The concept of the control system is the same, apart from the fact that the Su-27 was designed from the beginning as a fly-by-wire aircraft. The weapon system of the Su-27 is basically the same as the MiG, but the missions of the two fighters are different. The MiG is a frontline fighter staying within a hundred kilometers of its own lines. The Su-27 was designed to penetrate deep into enemy airspace. In spite of its size, the Su-27 is incredibly maneuverable. This one is being flown by the great Sukhoi test pilot, Viktor Pugachev. Like the MiG-29, the Su-27 can perform the tail slide at low altitudes. At this point, where the aircraft starts to slide back, the engines of most Western fighters would stall. On the Su-27, it does not. The second maneuver that the two contemporary Russian fighters have become famous for is the Cobra, where the nose pitches up past vertical while the aircraft continues to fly forward. It looks absolutely impossible. Russian air show crowds have come to accept the extraordinary handling of these aircraft as normal. This is ex-MiG pilot Anatoly Kvotsur, now flying Su-27s, making a low-speed pass at a very high angle of attack.
The Su-27 has a large air brake behind the pilot's canopy. It can be used in flight for rapid speed changes as well as for landing. Saturday, Discovery Wings drops in for the Dayton Air Show as the hometown of the Wright Brothers celebrates 100 years of flight. Join people from all over the country and enjoy everything aviation. We give you a front row seat for mind-blowing stunts and an up-close glimpse at the historic planes at one of the biggest air shows in the world. Celebrate the centennial where it all began. The Dayton Air Show, Thunder in the Sky, Saturday at 8 on Discovery Wings. The equipment that the Navy has is state-of-the-art. A lot of the equipment that I work with is leading technology. I spent most of my Navy career working in satellite communications. I actually went through 15 months of school. I've been through very extensive training in mathematics, physics, chemistry. They train you to be the best, and they expect you to be the best. It probably would have cost me around $25,000 for the total amount of training I went to. My parents were very excited that behavior was going to pay for four years of college. College professors come aboard to teach us while on the way. I am uh, two courses away from my criminal justice degree. What you've seen is just part of the story. Call this number now for your free 12-minute video and see how the Navy can jumpstart your life. Check out the jobs, training, and money for college that are waiting for you. My Navy experience has allowed me to step right into a respectable and fun job. Navy, accelerate your life. Since the late 80s, new versions of the MiG-29 have appeared. This one is the MiG-29K. K stands for the Russian word Karavny, which means naval. The MiG-29K was developed for use on the Soviet aircraft carrier Tbilisi. It has strengthened landing gear, folding wings, and a tail hook. The Soviet Union had no great tradition of carrier-borne fighter aircraft. The standard Soviet carriers were the small Kiev class, which operated only helicopters and Yak-38 vertical takeoff jets. Design work on the Tbilisi, which at more than 60,000 tons was to be large enough to operate conventional fighter aircraft, began in 1980. MiG and Sukhoi were commissioned to develop aircraft for carrier-based operations. This is the first flight of the MiG-29K, watched by MiG-29 chief designer Mikhail Waldenberg. For the MiG-29K, the Klimov RD-33 engines were upgraded. Since it would not be landing on muddy airstrips, there was no need for the fully closing intake doors and the louvered intakes above the leading edge extensions. In the Soviet Union, it was usual to leave prototype aircraft unpainted, revealing details of the structure of the surface. Test pilot for the first flight was Tokhtar Obukirov, a native of Kazakhstan. After this flight, Obukirov went on to become the first Soviet pilot to make a conventional landing on a Soviet aircraft carrier. Carrier trials of the MiG-29K, held in November 1989, were successful. These days, things have changed in what used to be the Soviet Union. The Tbilisi is now called the Admiral Nikolai Kuznetsov. Things have changed for Tokhtar Obukirov, too, since leaving his job as a Mikoyan test pilot, Obukirov has become the first cosmonaut of Kazakh nationality. He is now, in these post-Soviet years, 
the Minister for Defense for the Kazakhstan Independent Republic. The MiG-29M is another fly-by-wire variant. It carries the Russian equivalent of the most modern Western air-to-air -air missile. It's called the K-77, and its Western nickname is the Amaramsky. The MiG-29M is not just an air superiority fighter. It has ground attack capability that brings it very close in performance to the American F.A. 18. But currently the Russian Air Force doesn't have enough money to put the 29M into production. In the best traditions of capitalism, it's desperately looking for an export customer to help bring the next generation of the MiG-29 into existence. War, greed, politics, and personal hardship. The aerospace industry has endured it all. The struggles, the victories, the stories are next. Wings over the world on the Discovery Wings Channel. Landing in a tail dragger is a bit different from landing in other aircraft, mainly because the tail dragger's center of gravity is behind the main gear. When touching down in my tail dragger, I want to make sure that all three wheels touch down at the same time. I do this by keeping an eye on the runway when turning base to final approach. Once I'm on final approach, I need to use my peripheral vision to set the attitude of the plane. By looking out of the corners of my eyes and at the horizon, I make sure that I'm level. When I know that I'm level, I'm able to get all three wheels of the aircraft down at the same time. For wingtips, this is Nancy Lynn wishing you safe and happy flying. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. Only a handful of elite pilots know what it's like to have traveled at more than three times the speed of sound at altitudes of more than 70,000 feet in a high-tech jet that actually expanded around them as their speed increased. If the airplane and the systems were operating, uh, it was delightful. Now, on the other hand, if some of those systems didn't work, you very quickly had a handful of titanium. The challenge of averting disaster at such extreme speeds was enormous and was intensified by the fact that it often took the pilot more than 200 miles to decelerate and descend enough to land. The SR-71 Blackbird, the speed freak's wildest dream. The legendary Chuck Yeager became the first pilot to exceed the speed of sound on October 14, 1947, in the Bell X-1. Aircraft which had approached Mach 1 had experienced severe buffeting in the controls. No one knew for sure what lay beyond the so-called barrier. The small, bullet-shaped X-1 had thin, strong wings and an adjustable horizontal stabilizer. Yeager later wrote, leveling off at 42,000 feet, I noticed the faster I got, the smoother the ride. We were flying supersonic and it was smooth as a baby's bottom. Grandma could be sitting up there sipping lemonade. How far had we come and how fast? In 1947, 76 year old Orville Wright was still alive. Coming up next on Discovery Wings, experience flight across the globe, wings over the world.